Welcome back. Um, today I want to talk about um, doing a PhD in finance or to put it differently, to do or not to do. What I'm talking about applies to many fields, not only finance. Finance is um, a bit different because a PhD in finance also gives you opportunities outside academia. Now, um, in terms of my own experience, um, I have done a PhD. Um, I did um, one in economics. I have a background in economics. Um, later in life, um, and this is for a different video, um, I studied mathematics, um, a, a BSc and MSc. I, I started a second PhD, which I um, did not complete. So I can talk certainly about um, you know doing and not doing a PhD. I mostly worked in academia for about now 20 years. I'm getting really quite old um, and um, in various countries so in, in Germany, in the Netherlands and in the UK and I have done a fair amount of consulting work um, full-time at McKinsey and later part-time um, as well um, mostly around corporate finance, financial services, fintech, edtech um, and so on um, and I do a, a bit of um, content creation, mostly around data science um, and um, um, as well um, as um, executive education in this area. So analyzing data, having fun with data, you know, the good stuff. And of course, I do supervise PhD students now for many years and I interview um, potential PhD students. So I think I come across these questions quite um, frequently. So the number one question here is, why do you want to do it? So put differently, what is your motive? And I always question the motive when I interview um, potential PhD students because that's the main the main point, the main driver. If you don't have the right motivation, it's unlikely to succeed. The next um, interlinked issue is what do you actually want to research? Yeah, so if your if your proposal is not really workable, um, I think most likely you should just you know stop and reconsider. Um, and actually, it's also quite important to find the best supervisor. Of course, there is no best supervisor to be honest, but there are certain types that might be more or less useful um, for your type of project. So in this video, we'll talk about these issues um, and just give my, my take on them. And of course, as always, feel free to comment below. Number one for me is always, what's your motivation? End of the day, a PhD um, is um, about basically three to four years of your life. So you give away a big uh, part of your life. Um, and to be honest, when you look at this from an economic perspective, what do you get from it? Yes, yeah? so if you look at the job market premium, so basically how much more money do you make after doing a PhD? This premium is not massive. It, of course, it depends on your area, but in finance, it's not massive, except in certain in certain areas. If you go into hardcore quantitative finance, um, and then you get lucky and you you get into a hedge fund, yeah, maybe there is a premium. But very often, to be honest, if you um, think about this, you also lose three to four years of work experience in an industry, and quite often this is worth more. So I don't think there's a massive premium here, to be honest. Now, of course, the other um, main motive is to go into an academic job. But in particular, in finance, um, academic pay compared to what you get um, in, in, in financial services is, is, is not really attractive, to be honest. Yeah? So we can do a, a separate video on that. And also the job market is very, very competitive. Um, so if you look at, at this, you always have to have an option B. I will talk more about the job market and having a, a plan B in other videos. So what, what's the motive then? So why do you want to do a PhD? So I think you have to really think very carefully about your underlying motive. Very often I also hear stuff like, oh, my parents want me to do a PhD. Now, this is a really stupid idea, to be honest, you know. So if you you have to really grow up, sorry. But if you, if you tell me in an interview at the age of, of 24, 25, I do it because my parents have done it or my parents want me to do it, that's for me a big no-no. Now, many people, of course, do a PhD as, as a because they, they quite like having a title. Now, this in particular applies to, to the Germans in the room, um, but um, that's, again, not a strong enough motivation. It's too much pain, to be honest. It's too much pain, and the payoff is a lot less. 
So I think the main motive should be really, I really like this subject, I really want to do this type of research. This is what, what, I, what I really enjoy doing. And I think that's a much more important um, motivation. You have to have long-term motivation, otherwise it won't succeed. Of course, um, if you want to become a supervillain, you have to have an advanced degree. Now, this is really true. If you just look at this list, so, so many um, supervillains, this is not a complete list, obviously. Um, again, in the comments below, you can add a few more of them, but many supervillains have advanced degrees. Lots of them have PhDs, some even, you know, several PhDs. So when you just look at these, um, it does motivate you to also get a PhD yourself. Now, apart from this um, not too serious um, motivation, I think the key is you have to really like your topic. So the next point um, to make is, well, what do you want to actually do in terms of research? And I think here you have to make um, quite a few crucial decisions, um, which also then affect the search um, for the right supervisor. So number one question I always get is, should I select a so-called hot topic? The issue with hot topics um, is that it might be hot now. The key question is what happens after three or four years? So, of course, nobody can predict the future. So you have to be very mindful that sometimes a very hot topic now might cool down quite substantially after two, three years. There is always then a um, tendency to maybe go for something a bit more established. Yes, in finance, obviously, if you do some work on capital structure, this has been done quite a lot. Um, of course, then it's more difficult to find an area where you can actually make a contribution. What are the contributions you can make? It could be um, new data. So which gives you novel uh, empirical insights. Yeah? So new data, unusual data, things you collect yourself, maybe some social media um, data, different types of data formats which haven't been used before. So that can be quite a, a nice way to make a contribution. Then you can, of course, develop methodology. This could be, of course, um, better empirical tests. So um, this, of course, requires um, um, to be quite, um, you know, quite knowledgeable um, in um, empirical methods. Um, and of course, the, the other area is then, of course, theoretical development, which is honestly speaking very hard. One has to be honest, very difficult to do. So most um, students um, in, in finance would go for empirical work. Most of them focus uh, on uh, actually um, getting to novel empirical insights. So that's the main way to to make a contribution. In finance, um, doing something qualitative is not common. And honestly, I would not really think it's a fantastic idea. Um, it's just not there in the literature. So the obvious thing to do is do something empirical, do something quantitative. Now, um, um, end of the day, um, when it comes to your decision, do you want to do a PhD or not, it also should depend a bit on university choice, because if you don't get into the right institution, sometimes, um, you know, these arguments um, are even more difficult to defend. In particular, do you get a sufficient premium? Because here, of course, the reputation, um, facilities, networks, all these arguments do matter a lot. So um, one should be realistic. Yes, yeah? so if, if your aim is to go into academia, you need to have a strong institution, um, honestly speaking. It's much harder otherwise. It's not impossible, but it's a lot harder. Then finally, um, what's the best supervisor? So of course, this is not a complete list of different types of supervisor. Most people um, have different, you know, um, different combinations of these, um, you know, traits, so to speak. Yeah. So, but but there is a certain tendency that people are stronger in some areas and weaker in others. I will tell you what 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 I think I, I mostly um, do, but um, um, I'm pretty much um, um, the empirical researcher. So that's what I do mostly, but not all of it. I do quite a bit of theory as well. Um, other areas are not as strong. Yeah. So some people are amazing writers. I'm not. Yeah. So so that's in particular important if you go more 
into qualitative research or if you if you go into this intersection between management research and finance research then of course writing becomes more and more important um, in quantitative finance you can get away with um, you know more technical writing creativity of course um, matters um, some people are more creative than others um, it's it's hard to train for creativity so some people you know have the ideas have the excitement but they might not be very structured yeah so that also depends some um, um, some supervisors are very good organizers they, they provide a structure they give you um, you know clear targets and um, they are on top of your project they manage you as well um, I honestly don't do that very well other type which is also useful is a networker so yeah, I know lots of people um, that are actually very good in in building networks yeah and communicating um, their findings and engaging with various communities um, so again it depends on what type of research you want to do yeah and what what kind of support you actually need you won't find um, someone who is great in in all these aspects this is quite unlikely yeah so you you will have people that are maybe ticking two or three of these boxes to some extent good i hope this was helpful um, if you um, want to know more just um, leave a comment below and i'll see you in the next one